and my first time in Dublin, this is actually a very nice uh, city. Um, I want to first start with um, thanking people who enabled uh, this work. Uh, our work is primarily supported by the Liz Turner ALS Foundation. We were, our lab was founded in 2008, and we also received funding from ALS Association. And my first grant actually came from Brain Research Foundation, and I'm funded by NIH as well. And I may not have time uh, to thank people later on, so I want to do the acknowledgement side first. Uh, we have an ever-growing lab, and I will be talking mainly today about Dr. Um, Javier Hara's work and Dr. Barish Gange's work, and um, uh, Barish and Javier. Uh, but we have our postdocs, PhD students. We have, I think, more than 15 people, and we always have uh, room for enthusiastic and hardworking in the lab. Um, oops. I also want to mention that in this talk, uh, I will be mainly talking about the project uh, with our uh, current uh, collaborators, Nin, uh, Steve, um, Matthew, uh, Dr. Roos, Eileen Pichio, Marcel Moslem, Genghis Gaila, Gordon Shepherd, and Patrick Sheets. And this, even though we have uh, numerous other collaborators today, I'm going to talk about the projects that we work together. And now I want to um, talk a little bit about a neuron population. Uh, that we all know, but maybe we don't uh, focus our attention too much to. And these are, we call them the corticospinal motor neurons. And in the human, they are named bed cells. But in the mouse, the, uh, their name is actually not so much um, agreed upon. Some people call them upper motor neurons, corticospinal motor neurons, corticospinal projection neurons. And we can't even agree on their name. And we also do not, I think, appreciate their importance. And one reason for that could be that they are very few in numbers. Maybe there may be two million cells and neurons in the cerebral cortex, but maybe we would have about 150,000 or 200,000 upper motor neurons. So if you look about, if you think about it as in, in mathematical terms, they are almost background, they are very few. But their job is very important. And we consider them as the spokesperson of the cerebral cortex because uh, they receive information, and I'm going to tell you here, that they collect information from many different neurons in the brain. Long distance projection neurons, local uh, circuitry neurons, and they are modulated by inhibitor neurons, excited to the neurons. Um, and they integrate that information, that this massive information, in a very, very short time, and they convey this information all the way to the spinal cord targets. So they have a very long axon, and they convey this information to specific targets, not only all spinal motor neurons, but to their communication targets. So for example, when I am moving my arm, I am not moving my leg. So each time that we walk, we open the door, we uh, play the piano, uh, we have a cognitive movement, these are the neurons that actually do the job, the most important job, that they are modulated by the cortical neurons, they integrate that information and they convey the information to initiate a cognitive movement. And I don't think we understand or appreciate their importance all that much. And um, because of that uh, unique uh, importance, I think they are also uh, fundamental for the motor neuron circuitry, and that it is the motor neuron circuitry that degenerates in ALS. And I think that's why when we talk about ALS, we also have to think about these motor neuron populations uh, in more uh, d detail and critical terms. All right. So you may be familiar with this uh, hypothesis of dying back phenomena, that the disease starts in the neuromuscular junction, and then the uh, progress is towards spinal motor neurons, spinal motor neurons degenerate, and then corticospinal tract degenerates, and then the upper motor neurons or the bed cells of the corticospinal motor neurons degenerate. So then the last part that degenerates in the disease is, is thought to be the upper motor neuron. And that phenomenon, or that thought, I think they um, how can I say it in a nice way? I, I think it made us uh, look to a different uh, position and 
made us uh, change our view from where the focus should be. Because um, in ALS, if it is the motor neuron strategy that degenerates, and if it is the upper motor neurons that are the driving force or the um, executive um, board member, let's say, for the initiation modulation of movement, I don't think that we should be thinking that these are the secondary, their death is secondary to spinal motor neuron loss, or just a consequence of uh, progressive cellular degeneration. It may be that it is actually uh, a network. It is the whole motor neuron function that is impaired. And in that case, uh, optimal neurons play almost as important role as the spinal motor neurons. And I think we need to be thinking not in a linear fashion, but more in a, a complex fashion. But this is uh, mainly a, a connectivity problem and a network problem. And I had to pick the photograph of the, uh, oops, the Istanbul uh, bridge because this is the bridge that connects, this is the only bridge that connects both uh, Europe and Asia, two different continents. And I think that the, when we talk about the connections and circuitries, we should be thinking about how the bridges are maintained and how, how we can uh, protect both sides of the bridges, not only one. All right. So there is recent evidence now, or, and more also building evidence, that it is indeed the upper motor neurons that contribute to disease pathology, and that they are the degeneration is not really secondary, and that they, uh, targeting their health may have a, a potential impact for the betterment of uh, a patient's health and condition. Initially, uh, we found that, especially in the SOD1 mouse, that upper motor neuron degeneration was an early event, and we detected uh, for it was spinal motor neuron degeneration in a pre-symptomatic stage. But then work from uh, others, especially uh, Dr. Bellingham group, showed that these cortical spinal motor neurons indeed um, show spinals as early as P21. So that was very um, eye-opening because these neurons uh, begin to lose their connections as early as P21. And that's important, as you may imagine, for their cortical modulation. And Dr. Wookiee's group uh, in Australia uh, I'm sure you read many of their papers. They show that there is hyperexcitation very early in the disease, even before symptom onset. And now they can actually be used as an early detection marker that most of the LS patients undergo cortical hyperexcitation even before they display any, uh, any um, symptom. And then uh, work from uh, Dr. Spencer group show that if you actually improve uh, the SOD1 mutation in the uh, motor cortex of rats, you not only improve the health of the spinal motor neurons, but also the neuromuscular junction. So I'm going to, uh, when you actually see spinals at this level, um, most, when most of the apical dendrites are filled with vacuoles and they lose their, their spines, uh, it is almost before a symptom onset is, um, is, a, is a, in, the, in the mouse. And recently, working with um, Dr. Mahmoud Kari, and he generated the profilin transgenic mice, and hopefully it will be published soon, that we found that even in this mouse, which shows a phenotype, by the way, these apical dendrites also show a vaculated and degenerating pathology. So it tells us that this phenomena, the cellular phenomena, is not just restricted to one, um, one mouse or one uh, disease underlying factor, not SOD1. So when you have um, a cellular degeneration, mainly the cellular degeneration in the upper motor neurons are the uh, degeneration in the apical dendrites. But again, this was all mouse, and we wanted to investigate if the same cellular pathology is also observed in the human patients. So I am thankful to um, the Les Turner ALS Center uh, for uh, giving us the um, Postmortem human samples, as well as the University of Chicago and they use for this collaboration. And here I, I will show you the normal controls. You would see the bed cells in their 5D players. They have large cell bodies and they have apical dendrites. And we had cases of sporadic ALS, familial ALS, FTBLS, and Alzheimer's disease because we know that the motor cortex is not affected in the Alzheimer's disease patients. If you look carefully to these neurons, like in the normal control, 
you actually have a very nice cell body, right? Very long, nice uh, apocodendrite. <laughs> but that wasn't the case with familial or sporadic or familial ALS cases. The cells looked really sick. But that wasn't so true for Alzheimer's. But for almost all of the ALS cases that we looked, cell bodies were very sick. And this wasn't something new. Everybody, you know, people have shown that, especially in the postmortem samples, that there is defect in the cell body, right? These cells are big. What caught our attention was the apical dendrites. There seem to be some defects in the apical dendrites. So we focused our attention to the apical dendrites, and I'm going to show you some uh, results and some quantifications. And if you look at the normal controls in Alzheimer's disease, you can see these apical dendrites. But in sporadic, familial, or FTD ALS, um, the the apicodendrites were affected vastly, and they were either falling apart or they were filled with vacuoles. This is sporadic, this is familial ALS, and after a while they become ghost-like and they, uh, they disintegrate, and also in the FTD ALS. What was interesting though, if you look carefully, most of the defect was in the apico, uh, the, um, you know, the, towards the pia and coming down the cell. And you, you could still see some spines in here, but the, the vast majority of the optical dendrites were uh, basically falling apart. And you may wonder what, what is going on and what is in their optical dendrite that they, they are affected that much. And I'm going to take you back to um, a mouse model, the Alcin mice. And as I told you, uh, we were given by Dr. Dang and Dr. Sidi. And this was a work that we have done with Marco Martina and uh, Dr. Shekharkova. And this is an EM image uh, of the upper motor neurons in an ALSA knockout mice. And if you, oops, if you look, uh, the, um, the, the uh, CSMN are labeled by GFP. So if you do GFP, MINO, follow, and then EM, you can actually see which neuron is GFP. And this is a CSMN. You can see that the apical dendrites that are filled with vacuoles are actually GFP positive. And if you look carefully, um, what is in those uh, vacuoles, they are pieces of cellular debris. It is an active uh, self-eating almost. And, you know, there are vesicles and some friends even told that this could be par parts of the mitochondria, lysozymes, and so forth. But there is an active self-eating and the apicodendrites are falling apart. Um, so I want to tell you about some of the quantifications that we have done. And we looked at the percent regulation in, um, oops, in um, sporadic ALS, familial ALS, FTD ALS. And these were very high numbers, like 80, 90% to about 0%. So the difference is very high. So you would imagine that this is an end stage patient, but something happened along the way, so it didn't, uh, you know, th this is a very uh, high shift. And if you look at the bed soma size, soma area, and percentage of activated dendrites, there is an accumulation here for the normal control in Alzheimer's disease, but there's a variation here, especially for the familial ALS cases. This one, for example, this did not, the bed soma area did not change much, and when you look, this is actually the patient with I, uh, uh, 113T mutation, and which was previously reported to show low penetrance and variable clinical manifestations, and not so much with the upper motor neuron loss. But if this was the one that showed the very high level of vacuolated, but they're also very small, and that patient was the one with the G93 mutation. And um, I wanted to point this out to you. And the other thing is that we looked at the um, hippocampus because some of the reviewers said. Maybe this is a pathology that you see in all degenerating neurons. Maybe if you look carefully to the hippocampal neurons in Alzheimer's disease patients, you would also see uh, apical dendrite degeneration. And this is exactly what we did. When you look at the hippocampus though, uh, most of the cellular uh, defects were in the soma. So you would see all these GBDs and they uh, had uh, cellular, the, the soma was mostly affected. You had neurofibrillary tangles, but if you look at the apical dendrites, the apical dendrites were basically normal. This was mainly the only sample that we found with the uh, apical dendrite defect. So it wasn't really that all degenerating neurons or all vulnerable neurons have apical dendrite defects. It seems to be very specific to the bed cells in a broad spectrum of ALS cases. And you may wonder, oh, 
Okay, so you may wonder if they still receive inputs, even though their apicodendrites are affected to this level. So we have done uh, PSD95 and synaptophysin immuno, and for PSD95, you would also imagine that it would be along the apicodendrites. Here's the apicodendrite in MAP2, and synaptophysin is around. In the normal cases, you actually find couple that are in close proximity. These are four micron sections, and of course, you know, it would be impossible to uh, have them fully matched, but uh, you actually see uh, potentially active synapses. But that's not the case for any of the ALS cases that we have investigated. You really don't have too much of the PSD95 left, and synaptophysin is also affected. But it was very hard to quantify this. Then we took actually a broader approach. Um, and we looked at the site of the apical dendrite, because this is where the cortical modulation takes place, especially with Gordon Shepard's work and with others in the field. Uh, we looked at the site of the apical dendrite to find that uh, their uh, synapses are also um, affected, that they are not modulated uh, by other cortical neurons. And I'm going to talk very briefly about the work that we have done with Gordon Shepard, because these samples that I show you as port are post-mortem samples. You would expect this to happen. But when you look at this, so the SOD1 mice, and this is P30, okay, before any symptom occurs. And Gordon actually developed a way of uh, cortical mapping, and he was able to understand uh, which neurons talk to the cortical neurons. And I'm not going to go too much into detail about the technique, but he records from the uh, upper motor neuron, and he listens to the whole field, and whoever talks to him lights up. So then, when, as recording from this neuron, he, he can detect who talks to this neuron at, at the time of recording. And I'm going to tell you that in the control cases, in healthy cases, the inhibitory or excitatory circuits, uh, so here, here is the excitatory circuits, and you actually are excited from layer 2 3, but in the wild type, in the SOD, it is the same. But the inhibitory circuitry is actually affected very early in the disease, and especially in layer 2, 3, where most cortical modulation takes place. And that occurs uh, at P30. But if you look at, uh, this is a close-up view. Here, the defect is mainly in layer 5, and not really in the soma. And, but if you look at the colossal projection neuron, that's a control neuron population for us, because they are born at, uh, from the same progenitors, migrate together, settle together, but they don't die in ALS. And in that case, these are actually perfectly fine. In the SOD1, their modulation is not affected. So coming back uh, to the hypothesis then, this corticospinal motor neurons are heavily modulated by long-distance projection neurons, all the way from the thalamus, from the contralateral hemisphere, and also interneurons uh, play a role as well that are located here, and they also inhibit <coughs> some of the interneurons here. So there is a big crosstalk at this. And if the corticospinal motor neurons display an apical dendrite defect and that they don't have spines and they cannot be communicated to, this we think is an early event in ALS that the cortex cannot talk to the spokesperson of the cerebral cortex. Therefore, the proper message cannot be sent to the spinal motor neurons. And this may uh, advance uh, the motor neuron circuitry degeneration that we observe in ALS. And that we think that uh, ALS is a network degeneration and defects in cortical connectivity is an early event. And bed cell pathology does indeed contribute to disease. And apical dendrite degeneration is a uh, cell pathology. So coming back to this slide, die back, die forward, I think we shouldn't be thinking about in linear terms because it is very complex. We should be thinking about networks and connectivity and uh, cortex and spinal motor neuron at the same time. And um, if we improve the health of the bed cells with upper motor neurons, we think that we would really improve the whole motor neuron circuitry, not just the bed cells. And that the upper motor neurons are indeed uh, important cellular targets for future clinical trials. And I'm going to be very bold and say, uh, maybe one of the reasons for failed clinical trials in ALS is because we really ignore the cortex. So far, none of the compounds that moved into clinical trial, none of them were tested for their ability to improve or promote neuron health. And I think that should, if we change that in the future, our, our success rates may change as well. So with that, I would like to um, thank everyone, and basically Barush and Javier, for the excellent work that they have done. Thank you so much.
you very much, uh, Hande, for the story talk. You have uh, one or two short questions? Yeah. Uh, really excellent talk, really nice and uh, very beautifully presented. I had a question. You just, yeah, one of the things you are saying that's basically a pet cell that's dysfunctional initially, and then you say the interneurons are probably involved later, or they're not, the interneurons are not able to communicate to the pet cells. But the other possibility is that when you look at one of your staining, PSD95, the state was very, very low. So is the communication itself affected in these cases, or are the interneurons already damaged? Yeah, I'm going yeah. So I haven't, I don't have, I didn't have time to show the interneuron uh, component. Uh, there are a couple ways to start to study the interneuron or promoter neuron uh, interaction. There are many uh, molecular markers, as you know, for different subsets like MP by somatostatin and so forth. And you can do the aminos and look at their counts so forth. But then having the uh, expression of that marker does not really tell you if that uh, interneuron is active or inactive, and just or maybe they lost the expression, but the cell body is still there. There are molecular markers now, uh, reporter lines for interneurons. It would be best to cross them with the SOD1 and then do double uh, uh, recordings. And actually now, Patrick Sheets has his own lab. And those are the studies that we are doing in collaboration with him, that we want to see what type of uh, interneuron are affected uh, early. And I also need to tell you that the interneurons in layer, uh, layer 5, they have an input to interneurons, I'm sorry, interneurons in layer 2, 3 have an input to interneurons in layer 5. So when they are overexcited, they inhibit the interneurons in layer 5, which eventually causes hyperexcitation. So that we also detected. It's kind of simple. Uh, yeah, we have a question. Yeah, so maybe you can ask the question. Maybe I'm not sure. Yeah. That would be great. A short question, yeah, yeah. Short question. To, to illustrate the importance of the corticospinal tract, she showed this nice image of this long suspension uh, bridge over the Bosporus. Now there's also a tunnel uh, under the Bosporus, and they are descending. <laughs> now let me, uh, and they are descending tracks. Apart the corticospinal tr uh, um, tract, for instance, rubospinal, tectospinal right. tract. In your opinion, what is the relative contribution of these different descending tracts to normal motor function and to uh, motor dysfunction in ALS? Yes, this is an excellent question, and I uh, deliberately stayed out uh, of that because if I start, stay, you know, that the uh, mouse is actually not a very good model for motor neuron. A circuitry because in humans there's direct connection, corticospinal tract is very important, and uh, if, but rubrospinal and other projection uh, fields are more important for the mouse. So if I study those, then I would be studying mouse. But I didn't want to study mouse, I wanted to study the cell biology, and that's why I stayed away from the corticospinal about, about the action. Okay, thank you. Very last question, very short. Beautiful work, Thank you. Uh, uh, I have more comments regarding the use of DNA mice because they're prone to overexpression on defects. Um, I don't like them very much, but one such overexpression on defect is the overloading of the intermembrane space of mitochondria with someone that is hundredfold, which makes the mitochondria form, form vacuoles. And I wonder if it's such vacuoles that you see. I think you should test also other models that are not prone to this problem, like the 85 hours or titration neutral trust and so on. You're right, and I didn't mention here, but we had a human molecular genetics paper published with the British group, and they don't have overexpression of SOD1, but single copy. So the, the mouse develops the disease, but at a later age. So we had the uh, paper actually published, and we, indeed in that mouse we see a promoter neuron degeneration as well. And also the vacuoles. Uh -huh. yeah, the vacuoles I didn't check, but I have looked at the cell biology, but at the time it was very uh, new. But I should, we should be checking that, yes. All right, thank you very much for the question.